This morning we begin what will be a seven-message series through the book of Ezekiel, although it will actually take place over nine weeks because uh, in the middle of these messages we're going to have a couple of psalms, a couple of our interns, uh, Timothy O'Day and Bob Sparks will be preaching on Sunday mornings for us. And so we'll go a few weeks in Ezekiel and then a psalm, a few more weeks of psalm, and then we'll finish up the book. But this morning as we begin... We're going to take up the first three chapters of the book of Ezekiel. If you've picked up a Bible from the back table, you'll find that on page 692. And for the public reading of God's Word, I would like to read uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. So would you stand and hear the reading of this first chapter of the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. In the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the Chebar Canal, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiachin, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel, the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the Chebar Canal, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. As I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north, and a great cloud with brightness around it, and fire flashing forth continually, and in the midst of the fire, as it were, gleaming metal. And from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had a human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings, their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like burnished bronze. Under their wings and on their four sides they had human hands, and the four had their faces and their wings thus. Their wings touched one another. Each one of them went straight forward without turning as they went. As for the likeness of their faces, each had a human face. The four had the face of a lion on the right side, the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces, and their wings were spread out above. Each creature had two wings, each of which touched the wing of another, while two covered their bodies. And each went straight forward, wherever the Spirit would go as they went, without turning as they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire." like the appearance of torches moving to and fro among the living creatures. And the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. And the living creatures darted to and fro like the appearance of a flash of lightning. Now as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, each for, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of burl. And the four had the same likeness, their appearance and the construction being, as it were, a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went in any of their four directions, without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went. And the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those rose from the earth, the wheels rose along with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Over the heads of the living creatures there was the likeness of an expanse shining like all inspiring crystal, spread out above their heads. And under the expanse, their wings were stretched out straight, one toward another. And each creature had two wings covering its body. And when they went, I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of many waters, like the sound of the Almighty, a sound of tumult, like the sound of an army. When they stood still, they let down their wings." And there came a voice from above the expanse over their heads. When they stood still, they let down their wings. And above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne, an appearance like sapphire. And seated above the likeness of a throne was a likeness with a human appearance. 
and upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal, like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward what, from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire. And there was brightness around him. Like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. To remain standing as we pray. Father, help us this morning. Give us ears to hear so that as your word is preached, we might have ears that want to obey. Indeed, you have given us ears as your people. We have heard the voice of our good shepherd and we have come to you. We recognize as David recognized that you have prepared our bodies for you. Indeed, this morning, our act of worship is to give ourselves to you as living sacrifices. And yet, Lord, that is challenging. It is hard. We are tempted on every side. We are weak. We are enticed by our own evil desires. We are prone to pity ourselves. So we pray that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, and that you would comfort us, even as we look at the call of your servant, Ezekiel, this morning. We pray this for our good and in the name of Christ. Amen. You may be seated. As we come to the beginning of one year, uh, ready to embark on uh, end of one year, ready to embark on the beginning of the next year, it's probably safe to assume that many of us have visions dancing in our heads. Perhaps not visions of sugar plums, as in the story the night before Christmas. Maybe visions of eating fewer sugar plums next year. Visions of exercising a little more, maybe weighing a little less. Maybe this next year, we think, is the year we'll finally get that home improvement project done, or we'll start journaling a little more, or writing this. Maybe this is the year we'll finally stop procrastinating, or maybe that one can wait one more year. But regardless of how successful we are at keeping our resolutions, I do think there's something nice about the cycle of the seasons and the ending of one year and the beginning of the next. It's a time that just helps us evaluate ourselves, doesn't it? Just to look at our lives, see where our priorities are. Are we keeping as priorities things in our lives that should be priorities? Or are we allowing lesser important things really to rise to the top and, and, and things that should be important just trickle down to the bottom? It's a good opportunity to evaluate ourselves. It's also a good opportunity to evaluate ourselves as a church. It's to look and ask, as a church, are we keeping as our priority what should be our priority? After all, there's at least one task that if the church did not do it in this world, it would not be done. There are a number of good tasks that we do as believers as a church. Caring for the poor is a great thing. Caring for uh, the homeless, those who are less fortunate with us, is a great act of mercy. Caring for the sick, for orphans, for widows, uh, these kinds of things Christians should be leading the way in. And I would dare say if we just did a research throughout all of history, I think history would probably show that Christians have always led the way and doing these acts of mercy. But if we're honest with ourselves, if Christians completely stopped doing all of those things, and the church just stepped back and said, we're not going to involve ourselves in any of those tasks, which we shouldn't, but if we did, there would be somebody who would turn their attention to it, wouldn't there? There would still be someone, if the church did no desire to care for orphans, there would still be somebody who would, who would step up with compassion for these children who are without parents. There would still be someone who would, would step up and care for AIDS victims. But there's one task. That if the church stepped back from doing it, 
there would be no one to fill the void. And that task is the Great Commission. There is simply no one except the church of the Lord Jesus Christ who is making their task preaching the gospel to all the nations so that they might become disciples and obey Jesus Christ in everything He's called them to do. This is the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given us. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, you know this, but I'll read it again. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. That is our main priority as a church. That is a task, a commission that Jesus Christ has given that collectively falls to all of us. Each one of us has, has a role to play, a part to play in that broad commission that the Lord has given the church. And it's an overwhelming commission. It's not as if it's something we can labor in for a little while. Jesus tells us to go on till the end of the age. It's not something that we can engage in and think narrowly. The Lord says we're to make disciples of all the nations. It's not something that, that we, can, we can go at and think there's uh, simply a little bit to be done. He says that we're to teach them all things that He has commanded. It's a broad task. It's an overwhelming task. A, a task that will not end until the age itself ends. But as overwhelming as that task is, as we think of it as a church and our role as individuals in that collective commission, I do think there are specific texts from which we can find great encouragement, great challenge, and great comfort as we consider what our role is to be in that great calling the Lord has given the church. And one of those texts, which may seem unlikely to you, is the book of Ezekiel. Now, it's, it's interesting because uh, probably our first thought, if we've read through the book of Ezekiel, is this book and this prophet are both strange. And they are. It's interesting how many psychological tests have been done retroactively, if you will, on the prophet Ezekiel. This is like a psychoanalysis dream right here, this guy. Uh, throughout the book, it's just amazing, the strange things. When we've read chapter 1, I think it's safe to say that's a bit strange. This vision, wheels, and eyes all on them. We don't see this every day. Ezekiel, throughout the book, will see a vision. He will preach to bones. He'll go through a long period of time where he has to lie on one side of his body, day after day after day, and then lie on the other side, day after day after day. His wife will die, and he'll be forbidden from crying. We see just a number of odd things. In fact, Ezekiel, as we'll see this morning, goes through his life, and for seven years he has no small talk with anyone. No talks about the weather, or politics, or sports, or any of those things. If he opens his mouth, it's only to speak what God has told him. I think most people would say, it's an odd bird, and this is an odd book. So where do you just, just begin? If we're going to go over this book over the next couple of months, how do we even begin to get our arms around this, or our hands around what in the world is going on in this book? Well, I think there are a couple of things that can help us. One of them is just to get the background of the book in our minds. What's going on? And so let me give you just a little bit of brief two-minute history lesson here. In the year 600 BC, Babylon was the world power. They were in control. Everyone was to be subservient to them. And that included Judah. What Judah was supposed to do is they were supposed to uh, give money, give uh, tributes to Babylon. And Babylon was, was like a king over Judah. But what often happened in Israel's history and in Judah's history is the kings often rebelled. And they did this time. The king was Jehoiakim. Now, it's, I have to differentiate him from his son's name, Jehoiachin. It would be nice if he named his son something like Henry, wouldn't it? <laughs> but Jehoiakim was an evil king, and so he foolishly rebelled against Babylon until they decided to send their armies and seize the city in 598 B.C. In that same year, Jehoiakim died. And Jehoiachin, his son, then became king. And he wisely surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, to Babylon. You've got us, we're your prisoners. So what happened in 597 BC then is Babylon went into Jerusalem and took almost everybody that was of importance in the city out. 
the main officials, magistrates, those who had gifts, uh, uh, blacksmiths or craftsmen, um, again, anyone who had political office, or, or really most anyone, anyone who had wealth. These people were taken out and exiled out of Jerusalem in 597 B.C., leaving only the poorest of Jerusalem to remain. They even took Jehoiachin, the king, with them. Among those exiles that went out to make the 700-mile journey to Babylon and be exiles in Babylon, one of them was a young man who was studying for the priesthood named Ezekiel. So Ezekiel is actually exiled out in 597 B.C. Now, it would be another 10, 11 years before Jerusalem was ultimately destroyed. What happened is Nebuchadnezzar went and, and kind of put in a puppet king in uh, Jehoiachin's place back in Jerusalem. He says, uh, here, Zedekiah can be your king. So you'll remember from the book of Jeremiah, when Jeremiah is back in Jerusalem prophesying in this time, telling the people, stop rebelling against Babylon, it can get worse. Zedekiah is the king he's having to deal with. Well, eventually Zedekiah does rebel against Babylon, and they crush Jerusalem, 586 B.C. But again, that entire time Ezekiel has been over there. So from 597 B.C. on, Ezekiel is a prophet exiled from his land, living in Babylon as a prophet to his fellow exiles from the time before the fall of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. until the time after it. Ezekiel prophesies to the exiles in Babylon both before and after the fall of Jerusalem. So there's just some background for this book. A second thing that's helpful, I think, is just a brief outline of the book. And it really breaks down quite simply. Uh, I, I could have preached the book in three messages, Expanded it to seven, but if I were to do it in three, it would break down this way. Part one, chapters one through 24. What happens in chapters one through 24 is God calls Ezekiel to be a prophet, and then for the first several chapters of the book, Ezekiel preaches messages of judgment. Judgment is coming to God's people. Sure enough, it does come when in 586 BC, Jerusalem is seized and destroyed. Then something happens in chapter 24. If you'll take your Bibles, you can turn with me to chapter 24, and you'll note now a change in the book. In chapter 24, verse 1 and verse 2, we read this. Ezekiel 24, verses 1 and 2. In the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, write down the name of this day, this very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem this very day. You see, in a, in a time when, when, when news would take a long time to spread, God came to Ezekiel on this very day and said to him, on this day, I'm telling you, though you're in Babylon, on this day, Jerusalem has been sieged. They're about to be destroyed. So interestingly, through the first 24 chapters then, Ezekiel's message is judgment is coming, judgment is coming, judgment is coming, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. After he gets this news in chapter 24, his messages change. So that from chapter 25 through chapter 32, Ezekiel now preaches another message of judgment, but it's a message of judgment to the nations. This is what often happens in the, in the Bible. The Lord will raise up an individual to judge his people, and then the Lord will pronounce judgment against that individual. So this is what Ezekiel does. Chapters 25 through 32 are then messages of judgment to the nations. Then something happens in chapter 33. If you turn there with me, chapter 33 Verse 21, in this verse we're told, the rest of the exiles now get news. Jerusalem really has been destroyed. Chapter 33, verse 21, in the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day of the month, a fugitive from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been struck down. And from this point, Ezekiel's messages change again. So that from chapter 33 to the end of the book, chapter 48, we have messages of restoration, messages of hope. And it really just makes sense, just logically, then the, the flow of the book, judgment's coming, chapter 24, it comes. So chapter 25 to 32, the nations are going to be judged as well. Chapter 33, we then get the news, Jerusalem has been destroyed, everybody knows it now. And so Ezekiel turns his attention back to the exiles, letting them know there is a message of restoration, a message of hope. The Lord is going to come and care for His people. He's going to restore them. 
What we then find at the beginning of this book, in chapters 1 through 3, is the call of Ezekiel. And what God shows Ezekiel in these first three chapters, I think, is both helpful, challenging, and comforting for us. As we consider the, the, the commission that Ezekiel is charged with, and then think of our own commission in light of this, then the truths that God lets Ezekiel see and learn from, I think, are truths that also we can learn from that are comforting and challenging to us as well. So let's just look at this, uh, these three chapters this morning in three parts. The first part is this. A vision of the glory of God present with His people. A vision of the glory of God present with His people. This is what chapter 1 is about. The first thing that we hear in verse 1, Ezekiel says, in the 30th year. That is to say, in Ezekiel's 30th year. When, it, when Ezekiel was 30 years old, so a relatively young man, as an exile in Babylon, verse 1 says, I saw visions of God. Only this vision, these visions that we read about in chapter 1, are probably not uh, the kind of visions that we're used to. If we take Ezekiel chapter 1 and we say, this is what God is like. This is how God pictures Himself to Ezekiel. That would be true. But the intention is not, therefore, for us to take out our colored pencils and try to draw this. And say, you want to see what God is like? Here He is. Wheels and all of this. It's a strange picture. It's not to be recreated. Rather, the, the elements in this vision seem more to be symbolic. Some things that almost seem impossible. That you would say, well, well I don't understand. There, there's a wheel that goes this way, and then a wheel that goes this way, and they're interlocked with each other. But, but if you have wheels that are perpendicular, and they're both touching the ground, then they, they can't really work. But that's not the point. The point is not to, to try to think this out and figure it out. The point, rather, is to look at this and, and learn what God is saying about Himself. It's also a chapter that's just full of simile and metaphor. Uh, Ezekiel sees this. The, this is the Lord. But, but it's really just a, a metaphor for the Lord. Or, or the, I saw something that was like this. In fact, uh, the chapter ends in verse 28. Uh, the last uh, part of the verse, or rather in verse 28, the, chapter 1, the last part of the verse reads, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. See, Ezekiel's very careful. He says in verse 27, as I looked, what seemed like I had the appearance of a waste, right? From there, he's just, he's, he's just saying this is, this is just hard to get his mind around. Well, what does he see? Well, as this vision comes about, first of all, there's a storm coming so that there are flashings of lightning and fire. You see, at this time, there's, there's really nothing that is more powerful that, that, that could describe the Lord as, as much as the elements of fire and, and lightning. These kinds of things are, are the most uh, powerful images that we could probably think of. I mean, even, even in, in our day of all kinds of technological advance where we can create an atomic weapon, there's really nothing that just captures the kind of power that we see when a lightning bolt rains out of the sky and, and, and the sky thunders. This is common when the Lord appears to have storms like this. So just image of power right off the bat. And then Ezekiel sees these four creatures, and they're odd. They have legs that are straight, like human legs, but the soles of their feet are like a calf's hoof. Up from that, they have wings that both stretch out and cover their body, and yet under the wings are human hands. And then their heads seem to have four sides. I don't know if it was like some kind of block here, but their heads had four sides so that on each side, the head had a face. One side, the face of an eagle. The other side, the face of an ox. The other side, uh, the face of a lion. The other side, the face of a man. Well, these images probably would have been common in their day, used in literature. In fact, they were often used in literature to symbolize different things. The one problem is they're often used to symbolize different things. So if we were to guess at this, the, the ox, it seems, as you collect all the images of the ox and what he's used for, it seems like two things uh, really, really dominate. One of them is the ox is often used as an image of strength. As far as the land animals go, the ox is just strong. One of the strongest of the land animals. Also, the ox has been used multiple times in this kind of literature as an image of fertility. This is, uh, the ox is, it seems to be one who can multiply easily. So you have then this image of this, this beast of the field who is both one of the strongest and the most fertile. 
This is one uh, image, and then if you combine those, it would seem one of survival, of power, of strength. The eagle both has this image of majesty, the eagle, the, the greatest of, of birds, but also this image of care. In the ancient Near East, uh, one of the most predominant images of the eagles that's written about in literature is the care of the eagles. The, the, father eagle, the mother eagle would sometimes uh, push the young eagles out of the nest, hoping that they would fly. Sometimes they wouldn't. But what the father eagle would do then is he would hover in the area so that if it was too early and the young eagle was going to fall to his or her death, the father eagle would stoop in and catch it, upholding it on its wings, which is the same kind of imagery you read in the book of Isaiah, isn't it? The Lord will bear us up on eagles' wings. Right? This is a, an image of care, of both majesty and care. The lion, of course, an image of royalty and strength, being the, the king of the animals, and then the human, uh, the, the most intelligent, the only in, uh, beings created in the image of God. So we have in then are these creatures, as Ezekiel begins to get this vision of the Lord, the first thing he sees are these, these creatures and, and the power and the majesty and the compassion and the care and, 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 and all of these elements cannot be captured in just one image. Just to put a man up there would be insufficient, but, but a man with, with wings and legs and ox and eagle and lion, it's as if, if the, the Lord is saying, I am greater than you can imagine. And yet the creatures weren't all there was. First of all, as the creatures moved, they went straight in any direction without struggle. It's not as if they had to turn their heads. They had a face on every side. They just went in the direction of the face. As the Spirit moved them, they went. The Lord is here moving without struggle, moving with ease. And then beside the creatures were these wheels. Again, perhaps symbolizing the same kind of reality that the Lord moves wherever He wants without struggle, with great ease. And the wheels had eyes all in them probably suggesting the reality that the Lord sees all, the Lord knows all. And then there was more. Above these creatures and these wheels, there was an expanse. Uh, all of these images, uh, Ezekiel describes in, in terms of precious stones or metals, gleaming, uh, burl, and these kinds of things. And so Ezekiel says, above this expanse, there's just a, a beautiful uh, expanse here that, that with, with the loud sound of rushing waters. If you've ever been somewhere where there's loud, loud rushing waters or perhaps a, a waterfall, the sound can be just all-encompassing. Uh, you can even uh, stand near a waterfall and, and sometimes have to yell at each other to talk. Like the sound of thunder in the sky, you can exactly see where it's, hear where it's coming from because it, it just seems to be all around you. Ezekiel says, uh, this was the expanse and the sound. And above that expanse, there was, we read in verse 26, above the expanse, over their heads, there was the likeness of a throne. In appearance like sapphire and seated above the likeness of a throne was the likeness of a human appearance. And upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And, and downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and there was brightness all around him, like the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud on the day of the rain. So was the appearance of the brightness all around. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of one speaking. So what then are we to make of this image? Now, one thing I think we can say fairly easily is God is not like us, is He? If you want a picture of me, it would be a lot simpler than this. And a picture of my strengths, I could capture them in just a few words. This, though, is beyond description. God is not like us. He is one who is above us. The idea ever that we could sit and call the Lord to give an account for what He has done or judge His actions in the world or even set in judgment upon His Word is ridiculous if this is our God. He is much greater than we are. I think a second truth that we should draw from this appearance of the vision of the glory of God is simply that God is able to be present with His people. You see, one of the most amazing things about chapter 1 is that Ezekiel is in exile. And here God 
appears to him on this mobile throne that moves throughout. You see, the Lord was sending a message loud and clear to Ezekiel. Just because Jerusalem has been abandoned, just because the temple is going to be destroyed, doesn't mean I'm tied to that place. I'm with you here. And let me just make a side note of application for us. You may look back in your life at a time when you felt like you were much closer to the Lord. Like you really walked in a time of intimacy with God. Maybe it was a time when you were younger, and maybe you're thinking to yourself, you know what? If I were only as naive now as I was then, I think I could walk in closeness with the Lord again. But I don't know that I can ever feel that closeness because that, that situation in which I was at in my life, that's now gone. Or maybe you think back to a time when, when, when life just seemed better. Uh, your marriage was better. Your kids were behaving uh, better. You're, 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 you had more family around. Your siblings or children or parents or grandparents were still alive. And they're not now, and you think, you know, if I could just get back to that place and that situational life, then I think I can know the closeness of God. Or maybe it was even a time that was when you felt like your, your ministry was fruitful. You know, the time when, when we were doing this for, for the sake of missions, or we were doing that. I, I think this was a time when we felt particular closeness to the Lord, but that time is beyond us now. And maybe the enemy sends a lie to you day in and day out saying, you know what, you'll never know that kind of closeness with the Lord again. Because those days are gone. We need to recognize this morning, Ezekiel chapter 1 says that's a lie. God is not limited in being close and intimate and present with His people by where we are in life. What age we are, what's going on, any of these things. There are limitations we might consider in our own minds, but not God. This is the God who moves wherever He will, wills and comes to be with His people. But a third truth, and I think the most obvious one, is Ezekiel 1 sends a loud and clear message to Ezekiel, this is the God who is about to commission you. You see, if this is the God who then says to Ezekiel, as he does in chapter 2, Son of man, stand on your feet and I will speak to you. And then says in verse 3, I send you to the people of Israel. In verse 4, I send you to them. If this is the God who says to Ezekiel, I'm sending you, then I think our thought would be, Ezekiel, you really should obey. You should think twice about doing something else. Your answer probably shouldn't be to this God of Ezekiel 1. Well, I've thought about it and I think something will work better. Right? I think, I think something else would make a better priority in my life. No. Good grief. Are you kidding? This God commissions Ezekiel. Ezekiel better obey. Ezekiel better find himself encouraged and confident in his labor because this is the God who sends him. But I would ask us, is our situation really any different? Interestingly, we know another vision of a prophet in uh, Isaiah chapter 6. We know this vision, right? The Lord was seated on a throne high and lifted up and Isaiah saw him and Isaiah was so overwhelmed that he said, woe is me, I'm undone. It was another majestic vision, not exactly like this one we see in Ezekiel. But you know what John says interestingly? In John chapter 12, referring to that vision of Isaiah, John speaking of Jesus, and John writes, Isaiah saw him. That's to say, this image of Isaiah 6 is an image presented, a vision of God the Son sitting on a throne. It's therefore, I think, most reasonable to say this vision of God that Ezekiel sees in Ezekiel chapter 1 is a vision of God, the Son. Isn't this what John writes? No one has seen God at any time, but the Son has made Him known. When Ezekiel 1, the Son is making the Trinity known. He is making the triune God known. If this is the case then, the God commissioning, appearing to Ezekiel in chapter 1, God, the Son here, the one who is this brilliant, awesome God, is the same one who took on flesh and said to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, make disciples of all the nations. You see, our commission is not given by any less than the God of Ezekiel 1. Matthew 28, 18 is the God of Ezekiel 1 speaking to us. Yes, His, his glory is veiled. Because he's taken on a complete human nature. But it's this glorious God. Therefore, what we would say to Ezekiel should reign true for us as well. 
How in the world can we hear that God say something to us and respond, no, I would like to make something else my priority? See, this morning we are bound to ask ourselves, what role will I play in fulfilling the commission that God the Son has given His church? It may mean that some of us go overseas. It may mean that some of us self-sacrificially give of our, our time and labors and money and prayers, but all of us collectively are called to obey this God. So we see a vision of the glory of God present with His people. Second, we see a call to the prophet to speak God's word without fear and with faithfulness. A call to speak God's word without fear and with faithfulness. Let me just take that in two parts briefly. First of all, Ezekiel is to speak God's word. Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 4. The Lord says in the middle of that verse, I send you to them and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 7. And you shall speak my words to them. Clearly, Ezekiel is to say what God says. He has to speak God's word. Chapter 2, verse 8. It's now pictured God's word being put in Ezekiel's mouth in the form of a scroll that Ezekiel is going to eat. But you, son of man, hear what I say to you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. And when I looked, behold, a hand was stretched out to me. And behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it before me. And it had writing on the front and on the back. Keep that in mind. And there were written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. This is because Ezekiel is going to speak a word of judgment. And he said to me, Son of man, eat whatever you find here. Eat this scroll and go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to eat. And he said, Son of man, feed your belly with this scroll and I give it to you. And fill your stomach with it. Then I ate it and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. God's saying, I'm putting my word in your mouth. You're going to speak it. And he, he pictures it in the form of eating the scroll that Ezekiel eats. And though it's a message of lamentation and, and mourning and woe, it tastes like honey. But why in that day was the writing on the front of that scroll, on the back of that scroll? You see, that was hard to do. The way that scrolls were done with, with overlaid parchment is you made one side that was incredibly smooth. You could write on that side. The back side wasn't really smooth. So why then is the writing on the front and writing on the back? I think it's the Lord's message to Ezekiel. Everything you say, I've provided for you. There's no need for you to write your interpretive messages on the back. No need for you to write, how am I best going to engage the culture now? Nope, I've given you my word. Eat it and speak it. The way the Lord perhaps makes this most clear that Ezekiel is going to say God's words is in chapter 3. Specifically in verse 26. In chapter 3, verse 26, the Lord says, And I will make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth, so that you shall be mute and unable to reprove them, for they are a rebellious house. What God did to Ezekiel, and it lasted for seven years, was he shut his mouth so that he could not speak, unless God gave him a word to speak. And when God gave him a word to speak, it was a word of judgment. Now, can you imagine that? I mean, just think, think about this. It, it, it's sometimes, I think, easy for us to think of, of the Bible as if it's not real. But think of it. This is real life. So let's say, I'm Ezekiel. And I'm walking through the marketplace. And you say, Lee, how are your kids? Silence. Hey, what do you think about the weather? Silence. What about the basketball game the other night? Frowning silence. <laughs> right? None of that. No just socializing with people. If he opened his mouth, he spoke God's word. And it was one of judgment. Ezekiel probably didn't gain popularity during these years. Right? What was the message God was sending? You're going to speak my word. And nothing else. Now, I, I don't think that's something that we can directly apply. Don't say anything to anyone. Unless you're going to speak a word of judgment. But I do think it's fair to say 
What we should driven, be driven most passionately to open our mouths and speak about should be the gospel. It would be shameful for it to be known of us that when we open our mouths to speak, on most occasions, we're going to talk about something else other than the gospel. Or the, for people to say of us, man, get him talking, because you know what he loves to talk about, and there would be a list of a number of things before the gospel. Ezekiel is to speak God's word. He's not to alter it. He's not to change it. It's not for us or for him to say, how do we best think? What message do we best think the culture would receive? God just says, speak my word. He's also to do it without fear and with faithfulness. On two different occasions, the Lord tells him to be fearless. Chapter 2, verse 6. And you, son of man, be not afraid of them, nor be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns are with you, and you sit on scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks for their rebellious people. Chapter 3, verse 9. The middle of the verse, fear them not, nor be dismayed at their looks, for they are rebellious people. This is not the kind of do not be afraid messages we often send to our young children. This is not God saying there's nothing to be afraid of. Like we might say to our kids, don't, don't think there's a monster in your closet. There's nothing to be afraid of. God's saying here, you're going to walk through thorns and briars. They're going to be ripping into your skin. It's going to be like you're sitting down on a scorpion. Don't be afraid. You see, this is God saying, I'm not calling you to an easy task. Oh, it's going to be terrible. Their words are going to be like it's piercing your skin. The, the, the pain that they're going to bring you, being a rebellious people, is going to be like being stung by a scorpion. But don't fear them. Why? Because remember who commissioned you? The God of Ezekiel 1. Are you going to fear man more than that God? Do not be afraid and be faithful. Multiple, multiple, multiple times God tells Ezekiel, it doesn't matter whether they hear you or not, you speak. One example, verse 7. You shall speak, of chapter 2. You shall speak my words to them, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house. The Lord says it again and again and again. Perhaps the clearest example of God's call to Ezekiel is to be faithful is in chapter 3, verse 16 through 21. We, we, we know this imagery. It comes up again in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is told by the Lord, you're like a watchman. Like one who, who, who waits on the tower of a city overlooking the enemy. So that if the enemy comes and you warn the people and they don't respond, their blood be on their own heads. But if the enemy's coming and you don't warn them, then their blood's going to be on your hands. Ezekiel, you're like a watchman. So let's just ask this question. What could Ezekiel do to fail? If the people didn't respond to his preaching, would he be deemed a failure? No. The Lord says it doesn't matter. If they hear or refuse to hear, they're rebellious people. They might refuse to hear you. You speak. How could Ezekiel fail? Only one way. If he refused to open his mouth and speak. And the same is true for us. This is what the Lord has called us to. The only way we as a church can fail if we preach our hearts out and no one responds, then the message to us is, well done, my good and faithful servants. But if we refuse to open our mouths, we are disobeying the Lord who commissioned us and failing to warn the people and hold out the message of hope through the gospel. Ezekiel's called to speak God's word without fear and with faithfulness. And so the calling comes to us as well. Finally, in Ezekiel chapter 3, most specifically, we see an overwhelmed prophet provided for and upheld by the Lord. An overwhelmed prophet provided for and upheld by the Lord. Here's Ezekiel's response to this vision of God. The call that God had put on him. This scroll being eaten. Here's Ezekiel's response. Chapter 3, verse 12. Then the Spirit lifted me up, and I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. Blessed be the glory of the Lord from its pl this place. 
It was the sound of the wings of the living creatures as they touched one another and the sound of the wheels beside them and the sound of a great earthquake. The Spirit lifted me up and took me away and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, the hand of the Lord being strong upon me. And I came to the exiles at Tel Abib who were dwelling by the Chibar Canal and I sat there where they were dwelling, and I sat there overwhelmed among them for seven days. The most likely meaning of that phrase in verse 14, I went in the bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, was that Ezekiel's first response was one of bitterness and anger. The reason he sat silent for seven days is because he was overwhelmed. See, I think sometimes it's easy for us to, to imagine the prophets and the stories of Scripture as if they're fairy tales. Ezekiel chapter 1 through 3 is just not the stuff of fairy tales. What would be your response to the message that this is going to be your task to all of your peers? You're going to go speak words of lamentation and mourning and woe to them. That's what you're going to speak. And you're going to speak of it until the city's destroyed. Ezekiel's overwhelmed. He's bitter. His, his anger in his spirit. I think it sends a message to us loud and clear of a truth that I've echoed before as we looked at the book of Numbers. Obedience to the Lord doesn't always mean our expectations are going to be met. In fact, I would, I would argue it rarely means that. It doesn't mean there aren't blessings with obedience. Of course there are. There are blessings. Uh, I, I think I obeyed the Lord in, in marrying my wife and in, in having the kids we've had and adopting Nick. Uh, these, these kinds of things have, have been uh, things that I felt like are obedience to the Lord. But if you were to ask me 12, 13 years ago, write out what you think your life's going to look like, it probably wouldn't have looked like this. The, the, going, going to Russia for me was hard panicking at times and just praying and not having any answers to how in the world are we going to afford this was, was hard. So the questions I've had along the way about what we do with our kids is hard. When I pictured it in my mind, I always had the answers. When I pictured pastoral ministry, the first couple of years in my mind didn't look like what they looked like. They didn't conclude with me, you know, in my mind, in my, in my imagination, sitting on the back of my car, quoting the words of Jeremiah to the Lord, you deceived me and I was deceived. But that's what I did as I lamented before God. And I would imagine in your life and your obedience, there's been all kinds of mourning as well. The, the, the role the Lord is calling you to play as your part in this great commission, I would imagine, hasn't turned out exactly as you expected either. It's probably not the task you would have drawn up to yourself. You may look and say, you know what, if I could choose what my life looked like, it probably wouldn't be the way it is now. It, it, some dreams I had would have been fulfilled. Some failures I've known I would have succeeded in. Maybe you've wrestled with bitterness and anger at your lot in life. But we also see in Ezekiel chapter 3 a God who comes to his overwhelmed prophet and comforts him and provides for him. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 16, And at the end of seven days the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them a warning. God says to Ezekiel after seven days, I've made you this. In fact, he told him in chapter 3, they are a hard-headed people. I'm going to make you even more hard-headed. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 8, Behold, I've made your face as hard as their faces and your forehead as hard as their foreheads. Like emery harder than flint, I've made your forehead. Fear them not. God's saying, you're going to go to a people who want to headbutt you, but they've never felt a head as hard as yours. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to equip you. I know it's hard. I know it's not what you expected. I know there's going to be all kinds of self-sacrifice. But I'm going to equip you for the task. And the God of Ezekiel 1 says He will be with Ezekiel. In fact, in chapter 3, Verses 25 and, and following, the Lord just says to Ezekiel again and again, 
I'm going to do what you need done. Chapter, 20, uh, chapter 3, verse 25, And you, O son of man, behold, cords will be placed upon you, and you shall be bound with them, so that you cannot go out among the people. Ezekiel, I know it's going to be attempting just to go socialize with them. I'm going to keep you from doing it. Verse 26, I'll make your tongue cling to the roof of your mouth. Ezekiel, I know it's going to be hard not to talk. I'm going to provide for you. It might read like torture, verses 25 and 26, but it screams of the Lord's provision, doesn't it? I'm calling you to a hard task. Don't socialize. Don't talk about lesser things. But I'm going to bind you. And I'm going to make your tongue stick to the roof of your mouth. This is God saying He provides for His prophet. And He provides for us as well. Certainly, if you're in a place right now, in life, laboring to fulfill the Great Commission... And it's just much harder than, than, than you thought. As I said, if your lot in life is not what you thought it would be, one of the great things you can remember this morning is that the Lord has already met your greatest need, hasn't He? Already, when you were an enemy rebelling against God, weak at the right time, Jesus Christ died for the ungodly. God the Son of Ezekiel 1, that God, took on flesh dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross paying for our rebellion, paying for my bitterness sometimes against His calling on my life. He died to atone for the sins that you and I did in anger. He died to atone for our rebellion. He was then raised from the dead on the third day. Jesus Christ has met our greatest need. So whatever my lot, whatever your lot, He's taught us to say, hasn't he? It is well. It is well with my soul. And if he's met our greatest need, how will he not also provide for us everything else we need to labor obediently and in a God-honoring fashion with the task that he's given us? The glory, the vision of God, a prophet and a people called to speak his word without fear and with faithfulness, and a reminder that God will provide for us and equip us, though our calling may be hard and overwhelming. Let these truths comfort us, challenge us, and move us to give thanks to God this morning, even as we come to the table giving thanks to the Lord for having met our greatest need. Let's take a moment of silence now, and then we'll come to the table this morning, distributing the bread, distributing the cup, eating these together, and drinking them together, giving thanks for the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment of silence now as we come to the table.